Welcome to sermons from St. John's Lutheran Church. The members of St. John's are committed to sharing the good news of Christ Jesus, who was crucified in the place of sinners, so that everyone who believes and trusts in him will not perish, but receive as a free gift everlasting life. We invite you to join us for worship. We gather for worship every Sunday at 9 o'clock a.m. St. John's is located at 1000 Bluff Street in Beloit, Wisconsin. Our telephone number is 608-362-8595. Please visit our website at www.stjohnsbeloit.com. We are a member congregation of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Here at St. John's, we are eager to tell you that you have a Savior, who is Christ Jesus the Lord, and we invite you to receive the gifts that God delights in giving you through His Son. In the name of Jesus, amen. Our lesson from Jonah 3 concluded last week. With the Ninevites having put on sackcloth, sitting in ashes, crying out to the Lord God, in whom they've come to believe, that he might have mercy upon them, that he might forgive them their sins. And as the king declared in his edict, who knows, maybe the Lord will relent this disaster that he has cast upon us. And so it concludes at verse 10, with that very much being the case, when the Lord saw their repentance, how they sat in sackcloth and ashes, even putting the animals in sackcloth, taking no food or drink, not even feeding the animals, everybody fasting, and crying out to the Lord God for mercy. When he saw this, he had compassion on them, and he relented of the disaster of which he had warned, and he did not do it. And perhaps it surprises us when we open up chapter 4 and we read the words, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. First of all, it's a very soft translation of the Hebrew here. He's more than a little bit displeased and angry. The Hebrew there is he's inflamed. Think of enraged. The way that it's softened here, it's almost as if someone blows up your car. And after surveying the scene of where your car used to be, you look around and you say, you know, I'm just a little bit disappointed. That is not how you would feel. And Jonah is a little bit more than exceedingly displeased. He is enraged. Which, as I say, surprises us. He travels to Nineveh. And he travels across Nineveh declaring, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. The people hear his word, and they obey it. Unlike so many of the prophets who prophesied in Israel to a people who were stiff-necked and the message fell on deaf ears, these people hear the word, and they're converted. They repent, fasting in sackcloth and ashes. Jerry Vines, former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, in a sermon on this text says that this is the place where Jonah should be writing the book and going around giving talks at pastors' conferences, explaining how he did it. Here is the method for bringing people to repentance, for seeing conversions of hundreds of thousands of people. He was a success, if you will. But that's not how Jonah sees it. Nineveh is the enemy. He wants to see them overthrown. Wants to be first on the scene of seeing their destruction and suffering. 
And so he says to God, this is his prayer. It's a lousy prayer. O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. Have to come to the end of the story to find out what's really going on. Perhaps we were inclined to think it was merely fear of not wanting to bring a disruptive word to such a cruel people. But it wasn't. It wasn't at all. He did not want to see Nineveh be forgiven. And so he says, this is why I fled to Tarshish. Now you take back feeling kind of bad for Jonah, don't you? As you see his attitude. He says, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. This is the complaint that he lodges against God. Can you imagine complaining to God that he's merciful and he's compassionate, he's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love? But this is the very nature of God. This is whom he reveals himself to be throughout the Old and New Testaments. But now that that forgiveness, that mercy and compassion is going to be extended to his enemies, Jonah is inflamed. And here is how he ends his prayer. It's a lovely little prayer. He ends, Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Amen. Can you imagine? That's, that's his prayer. But the Lord God isn't done with our friend Jonah yet. Jonah goes out of the city, goes to the east of it, and he sits down. And he makes a booth for himself. Now, when you think booth, don't think a nice cottage on the beach. Think about a guy cutting down leafy branches and piling them up in sort of a lean-to type fashion. It is hot, and it is arid, and it is midday. It is not long before his friends, the leafy branches, begin to wither and dry up, and the little leaves begin to fall down upon the ground. But God causes the kikayon plant. The ESV, for whatever reason, just ignores kikayon. Kikayon is the plant from which we get castor oil. Maybe it's bad memories from childhood that cause them to just skip that altogether. I don't know. But it's a huge garden plant. And God causes this to grow up over Jonah and provide shade for him. And perhaps you're a little irritated by this. You think to yourself, well, why is God doing this? Jonah has been an absolute jerk. He doesn't deserve for God to provide comfort and aid to him. He deserves to sit out there in the hot sun. Well, just hang in there. Wait a minute. Because God is going to prove a point to Jonah with the kick I own plant. We discover that after he is under the leafy plant. Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant, which actually proves one thing, that Jonah is capable of happiness, because this is the first time throughout the whole book we've seen this guy be anything but angry. He's exceedingly glad. So look at what God does next. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant, so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah, so that he was faint. So God causes the plant to come up, and it casts some nice shade over Jonah, and he looks around, and maybe he thinks, the Lord God takes care of me and is exceedingly glad. And then God overnight causes the worm to come and to munch on the plant 
so that when the sun comes up, it scorches the plant and it withers and dies. And now, God brings one of those winds that come when the sun is just scorching, so that hot air is being blown in your face, not a cool, gentle breeze. One of those times when you wonder if the world is coming to an end, it's so hot. And that sun is beaten down on him hour after hour. Now remember, he doesn't have to be there. He chooses to be there. The mission is over. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it the word that I will give you. He goes there. The Lord gives him five Hebrew words. He cries out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people repent. They are converted and they repent. He can go home if he wants. He can go back to Tarshish, where he was headed originally. He doesn't need to be there. Why is he there? Because he has so much hatred in his heart for these people that he's sitting there just waiting, hoping that they screw up, hoping that they go back to their old ways, hoping that they show themselves to be the disgusting wretches that he knows that they are, that God may rain down hellfire upon them. And so there he is, the sun scorching his little head, hour after hour after hour, so that he becomes faint. He becomes faint, and he utters another awful prayer. He asks that he might die, and said again to the Lord, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry? And of course, has anyone ever actually done well to be angry? Of course not. It's a part of our sinful nature and it brings us much harm. But this time God says to be angry for the plant. And, and Jonah says, Yes! I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. Almost challenging God to strike him dead. And God would be just to do so. And here's the point. The Lord says, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I... Pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and much cattle. That's the point. God says, you feel badly about the plant. You didn't make it. And it wasn't here long. Came up in a night and it went away in a night. If you can feel pity for the plant, shouldn't I have pity upon Nineveh, that great city, in which there are 120,000 people who don't know anything about my ways and my will? That's what it means, don't know their left from their right. And also much cattle. Now, of course, the word here for cattle in Hebrew can mean other cow, either cattle or all of the domestic animals. But the same word there, it shows that God has a great affinity for cattle, which should make people who live in Wisconsin smile, huh? That God loves cows. But remember, the animals are in sackcloth. They too are fasting. Their situation has been drawn to the Lord's attention. He says, should I not have the same pity or more that you have for some plant, for flesh and blood people whose lives are in peril and all the animals that dwell in that city. And that's where it ends. The book comes to its natural conclusion because it leaves us wondering. We don't have to wonder too far. The fact that Jonah writes the book is some indication 
that he repents. That he repents of his evil and he goes home and he writes the book with much humility because he shows himself to be quite the blockhead throughout this narrative. But it ends with that question, leaving the ball in our court. Paul David Tripp, in a sermon on this passage, asks his congregation, are there people in your life whom you would rather see suffer and be punished, to see get what they have come into them than to be forgiven? How about for you? Are there people or groups, nations, organizations that you would just love to see punished, laid to waste, obliterated? See, as we go through the narrative of Jonah, there's so much action, it moves so quickly that we can forget that we are so much like Jonah. Jonah is a picture of who we are in our sinful nature. We know God's commands, His law, yet so frequently we break it. We know that God has made calls upon our lives. And much of this involves some sacrifice. And we do everything that we can to get out of it, to wiggle out of it, or to think that's for other people, not me. And we know what it's like to look to God, asking for His mercy and for His forgiveness for us, while at the same time saying, Lord, do you see what they're doing? You want to punish them for that? In our sinful nature, it is very hard for us to watch God extend compassion and mercy to those people whom we don't believe deserve it. Now, when we're on our knees praying, we totally forget the fact that we don't deserve any kindness of God. And so the law condemns us, shows us how much like Jonah we are, and how far short of God's will we have come. But it doesn't leave us there either. After convicting us of our sins, this text, this narrative, this book teaches us above all the very nature of God. Yes, it teaches us the nature of Jonah and the nature of us, but it teaches us the nature of God. These Ninevites, if you look back in the days of King Hezekiah, when you're reading the books of Kings, you see that even a general of the Ninevites sits outside the city walls, taunting the Israelites and taunting the Lord God, saying that he is impotent. He is unable to defend his people. They have spoken more than blasphemous words against the Lord God. And what do we see? That he is quick to forgive. As they are converted and repent, he forgives them. Jonah takes the most beautiful attributes of God and lodges them as a complaint against him. That you are merciful, you are compassionate, you are slow to anger, you are bounding in steadfast love. Faced with our sins and the knowledge of where we stand before a holy God, what a message of joy and of peace to be reminded that he is merciful, he is compassionate, abounding in steadfast love, and is slow to anger, and as Jonah says, relenting from disaster. This is what you see in the crucifix. Those are the attributes that it reveals. That God, having taken on human flesh, 
bears our sins on Calvary's mountain and is put to death for them on the cross. You see, the very compassion of God, so merciful and so loving, that He forgives you all of your sins, each and every one of them. They have been blotted out in the shed blood of Christ. God has judged your sin and put His Son to death for them so that you are forgiven. You stand before God as a holy Christian people. You have been made right with Him. I pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to work upon you, putting away your anger and your jealousy, and my anger and my jealousy, bitter feelings towards other people. Take away that heart of stone, as Isaiah says, and have it replaced with a heart of flesh that's turned to God in love and neighbor in compassion and mercy. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please join me in praying the prayer taught by the Savior. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you for listening today. And may the gifts of God in Christ Jesus be granted to you by His gracious will. Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless you, now and forever.